Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We all know the verse of scripture that says, if God is for me, who can be against me? And that verse instructs us that when we are in his will, following his word, doing what God has commanded us to do, living faithfully and obediently, it doesn't matter who the enemy is. We can be assured that in the end, with God, we are going to experience his blessings, his promises. In other words, we are ultimately going to experience victory. That's what salvation speaks to, a glorious victory that is related to the promises of God and being one who lives eternally in the kingdom of God. But what happens when we're not living obediently? We're not walking in faith. We're not living out his truth. But we have sinned. We have rebelled. We have demonstrated disobedience to his instructions. Then can we say God is for me? No, we cannot. But here's the good news. And this is what King David is going to teach us. That even at those times when we have failed God, due to our own rebelliousness, our own disobedience, our own sinfulness, God, when we say, I'm sorry, when we repent sincerely, when we desire to turn away from sin and embrace his truth once more, then what happens? God, by covenant, he is obligated, and he delights in this. He is obligated to extend us his mercy, his grace, and we will experience forgiveness. That price for forgiveness has already been perfectly paid by the Son of God by Messiah. So we can see that relationship healed in once again. Be confident. Have assurance of that victory. That the enemy is not going to get the upper hand upon us. That there can be a glorious change in our life. Well, with that said, take out your Bible. And look with me to the book of Psalms and Psalm 60. Now, we'll see in a moment, David is the author. And initially, things aren't going well. David feels as though God has abandoned him, left him. But God doesn't do that in and of himself. When we feel abandoned from God, the reality is that we have moved that we have turned away, that we have disobeyed. God is always faithful. So let's begin Psalm 60, and it starts with that familiar inscription, information to help us have the proper context for understanding the content of, of the psalm. Verse 1, to the chief musician or choir director upon and this next word is the word Shushan. And Shushan here speaks of a flower, a beautiful flower, like a lily or a rose. And most scholars see that this is relating to the melody, the way that, that this psalm was chanted, or if there was instruments, the, the sound of the music that accompanied the singing, the chanting, of these words so we write to the chief musician that choir leader upon the lily that melody and then we have the word a dut which means witness or testimony 
In other words, this psalm is for the purpose of testifying, bearing witness. And what is David going to bear witness to? The faithfulness of God. That God allows, in fact, he encourages, in fact, he commands that when we're not in his will, that change is made. And when we want that change, God will move in our life and he will assist us to get back to where he wants us to be when we are in agreement that that's where we want to be as well. Next, we're told that this is that psalm and we've seen the last few meet this this criteria. It is a miktam. And I've mentioned that this tells us that the wisdom, that the content, that the instructions of of this psalm is more precious, more valuable than the finest gold. Then we're told once more that David, he's the author of it and the purpose of it. The last word in verse 1 is the word le lamed, which means to teach. So it has the purpose of teaching the the reader, the one who encounters this 60th Psalm. It's for the purpose of teaching them on how we need to respond when indeed we find ourselves outside of God's will due to our own rebellious. The fact that we are sometimes our greatest enemy. Well, let's move on to the next verse. It says here, verse 2 in Hebrew, when he went forth. Now, most scholars see this as referring to just not David individually going forth, for going forth, but him leading the armies of Israel. So the context, this word tells us the context is that of battle, of warfare. David does have an enemy in this psalm. So when he goes out, and the implication is for war, war with Aram Naharayim, a mighty people, and also Aram Tsova. So these two people groups that were strong and posed a great threat to David and his kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. And what happened? Well, look now to the the second part of this verse where it says, Yoav, remember he is a mighty general of David. He frequently is the one who's leading the army. And it says, Yoav, he returned and he struck. He struck Edom, another enemy of Israel. And he did so in the valley of Salt, And we find that 12,000 men, meaning this, that there were 12,000 men who who succumbed, who lost their life. Now look at the next verse. Now, it's not sure on how to understand this loss of life. But this is what we know. We know here that that David fills in this next verse, verse 3 in Hebrew, where it says, God, you have abandoned us. David feels that God has left his people, that there's a problem, that they are left alone. And he says, you have, and this is word to break forth. You have broke forth, and again, against us. Now, that would tell me that the 12,000, Yoav, He turned to go to battle to strike these these enemies. But what happened? 12,000 men fell to their death. And this is why David is saying now in our verse, he says, God, you have left us. You have abandoned us. You have, have burst forth against us. And then we have the next phrase, which means you have been angry and the implication is once more you are angry with us but david says something now he puts it into the future tense and the future tense can be used and frequently used in hebrew for commanding or a request 
And that's what David's doing. David knows that God has departed. God's not blessing the children of Israel. God's not blessing David's leadership. And most scholars agree the reason for this is David has been disobedient. Now, sometimes we have clear reference in an inscription of what we're referring to, some biblical time that we can read that as we have done in the past and know what's going on. But most scholars, in fact, I have not seen any that would disagree with this. In this psalm, there's nothing that truly meets the the biblical narrative to say this is when the psalm was written. But we know David, it was at a time that he felt abandoned by God, and that means David was in disobedience. David wasn't in God's will. He felt that God had struck forth his people and that this 12,000 had fallen and that God was angry. And therefore, what does David say? Remembering he puts it in the future here, a language of, of request when he says, you return unto us. That's what David wants. He is seeking God to return to the people return to his leadership lead him guide him empower him give him that revelation that instruction so that david can make now wise decisions and the question is is god going to do that yes he is david's desire for god to be with him and to lead him and to work in his life brings about and this is the the message for us that desire brings about a great change in our life and god desires that change he is going to move and respond to when we want a godly change in our life look now to verse 4 in the hebrew text where it says you have shaken the land you have have split it meaning you have had broken it into to pieces this is what david feels god has moved and he's shaken the earth and that's caused david to give god attention god has captured david's attention david sees the destruction the effects that the land probably referring to his kingdom in this context his kingdom has been broken and david's not pleased with that so he says once more similar to god you return unto us now he says rafa which means heal david wants god's healing in his life in his kingdom in his call david wants and this term healing can be understood as restoration being restored to spiritual health which will bring about a godly outcome so he says heal and then the next word is a word for those broken pieces so he says heal it's broken pieces for and then the last verse the last verb word of the verse is a word for for some will say falling but it's more like collapsing david is the leader and he sees his empire the nation that he's called to rule he sees it crumbling apart he sees it collapsing and he wants and knows that only god's presence and god's insight and god's power is going to bring about a change verse verse 5 in the hebrew text he says you have shown your people the word kasha which means difficulty something hard you have shown us difficult hard things experiences that were most difficult and what's the the source of this difficulty well it's sin in the camp it is one who has rebelled against the truth of god but but that's changing david's repenting david is wanting this this relationship with god to be reaffirmed and he wants the benefit of that so he says you have shown your people difficulty 
you have caused us to drink and the next phrase is wine but it's wine that has been poisoned so david is saying what we have experienced and sometimes drinking something is simply an idiom for experiencing something and he's saying god you you have left us you have broken the land you have shown us difficulty and now you've caused us to drink that that poison now sometimes in english we've we've had the expression about having to take your own medicine and that's what he's speaking about here it's not medicine but it's poison but the purpose is this poison drink is causing david to reconsider things he knows that the suffering the unpleasantness that that he and the nation of israel are experiencing is all based in sin and he wants a change verse verse six he's still petitioning god he says you have set and here again it's in the term of desiring this may this be done you have set your fear and this is where it gets so significant if we are going to experience godly change in our life if he's going to work if he's going to heal if he's going to restore it begins with us giving god priority and that's how so frequently when i talk about the fear of the lord i use that word priority The fear of the Lord is demonstrating in word and in deed. There's a heart change, a mindset that's different, that you are going to give the will of God the priority of your life. It comes first and everything else is subjected to him. It's not as though, well, I get done with my responsibilities to God and then I can go and do what I want. That is not the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord does, causes an effect on every aspect of our life continuously. It permeates everything. And therefore, David says, you have shown your fear. And then the next word is the word ness. Now, ness can mean a miracle. And we see something. When we give God priority, that's when things can begin to change miraculously if we're not showing and demonstrating god's fear in our life and remember the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom if we're not walking in fear giving god priority then then we shouldn't expect his miraculous assistance but that word nest can also speak of a a pole that that proclaims victory And when you look here, it says, you have shown your fear. And then we have the word ness. It's interesting. I'm looking at a a unique copy of the book of Psalms. Now, it's in Hebrew, but underneath the Hebrew is additional Hebrew. One is the biblical text, and the other text underneath is modern hebrew with with explanations and the meaning now the word ness i said is often translated as a miracle or a a sign on a pole that proclaims victory and that's exactly how underneath we have the word nitzachon which is victory so it's the fear of the lord that brings victory into our life and that victory and that message of of salvation is all for the purpose of of glory now what glory are we talking about the glory of god's will being fulfilled god is and hear this carefully god is wanting desiring to work in your life he is already predisposed his nature to work in your life But it's only when you are demonstrating, not just saying, yes, I fear God, that's nice, but not enough. It's only when you are demonstrating the fear of the Lord 
making him the priority of your life and subjecting every part of your life every aspect of your life to his will then that is an invitation for god to move miraculously in your situation so that through you you can be an instrument that manifests the glory of god now some translate this word here again in the the hebrew help underneath it has the word lehit pa'er Le pa'er means to be glorified and it's simply saying that god is going to save us and that he is going to to put his stamp of approval that glorious stamp upon us but this word lehit notes can also be related to to deliverance so he is going to work work miraculously for our deliverance in order that we can experience that that victory and notice what he says mi pane koshet sela on account of and this word koshet many bibles translated differently in english but it's a word best understood as truth now underneath they have the word here for emmet which is truth so god's going to move in your life on account of for the sake of his truth selah next verse because of his truth how he functions his word what he has promised what his desires are all of this is related to god's truth and therefore because of that what's he going to do he is going to deliver he is going to deliver it says here your loved one the one whom you love now who does god love here's the answer those who are in a covenantal relationship with him you and don't don't ignore this don't deny this don't think that that it's not true you will not experience god's love unless you are in a covenantal relationship with him does god love those people who are not in a covenant relationship with them with him yes he does do they benefit from that love they do not do they experience his love no they do not it is only when you enter into a covenant and how do you enter into that covenant through the gospel only through the gospel you reject the gospel you are saying no i do not want god's love and not only do i not want god's love i don't want his his assistance i don't want his counsel i don't want his perspective his insight i want to do it all myself and when you have that attitude you are choosing failure and eternal judgment upon you but when you choose wisely you're going to find that god moves for the sake of of delivery and who does he deliver his loved one that means you who are in a covenant relationship with him and he is going to save it says save and mostly save with your right hand meaning god is going to bring about salvation and he is going to answer david says answer me answer me with this saving right hand in order that i am in position once more in victory what's victory this is very important that you hear this there is a inherent relationship between victory experiencing victory and being in god's will so when was the last time that when you get before god in prayer that you say god help me to be in your will not just located but doing your will putting into practice god's purposes his priorities for our life and for a given situation that we might be the body of messiah doing the will of god verse verse 8 in the hebrew text now beginning with verse 8 we see this change that that god is going to to bring about this change that we see a foreshadowing of by david's request and notice what ha- what 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 is written here it says elohim diber be kocho which means 
God has spoken in His holiness. Now, holiness is related to the purpose of God. It's related to sanctification, and sanctification is being set apart for a purpose, obviously the purpose of God. So what this verse speaks of is that God is speaking to David, and he's speaking to David God's will, his purpose, so that David can demonstrate this obedience, this fear of the Lord, that David can position himself with God's help, God's God's illumination back to God's will. And he says, God, he has spoken in his holiness. And notice this. He says, and I will rejoice. Now, the context is this. David is seeking God, perhaps for quite some time. And God has initially been silent. David says, I want to repent. I want your mercy. I want to experience your forgiveness. I want to be renewed and restored. But time has passed. God has been quiet. David has felt utterly abandoned. But now there's a change. And with this change, it comes initially by revelation. God speaks. God has spoken in his holiness according to his purposes. And David says, David now knows God's will, what God is calling him to do, how he's supposed to respond in the midst of this very unpleasant situation, which is of his own making. David says, I will rejoice. Understand, there is a close connection between God revealing his illumination, what his will is, and us experiencing joy. See, you can't know true joy unless you know the will of God for your life and for that given situation. It's when I behold God's will, His purpose, that that I'm going to now be on a pathway as I move towards that of rejoicing. And notice what David says he's going to do. I am going to divide Shechem and the valley of Sukkot I will measure. Now, these are terms saying I'm going to have authority over these places. I am going to extend my authority, my rule over this place. Shechem. Now, today, Shechem is called by by the Arabs, Nabulus. And it's so disheartening to me that, that people come to visit Israel and they use the Arabic terms for these cities rather than the the biblical names so david says i'm going to divide up meaning i'm going to divide and conquer shem and the valley of of sukkot i'm going to measure out meaning place and order and it gets better than that we see this restoration of david exerting authority over these places that apparently were lost in the battle he says gilead is mine manashe and Ephraim so these places and by the way you need to realize that some of this speaks about the other side of the Jordan River now if you read the book of Samuel of course there's two if you read first and second Samuel correctly you will see that David at one time exerted his rule his authority over over the Jordan River to the extent where he was right at the the river of called the Euphrates but now we see that there's a restoration Gilead is in modern-day Jordan he says Gilead is mine Manasseh and Ephraim is mine and then he speaks about Meoz Roshi Roshi is my head and Maoz is usually a word for strength I believe many Bibles translate this, and I'll look at the, the help. It says here, Tihie Magen, meaning will be a, a shield or a protection. And I think many English Bibles translate this word meoz as a helmet because it protects the head. But it's simply the strength that God's going to be a strength for my head, meaning David's head. And Judah 
is going to be the place where law is rendered meaning from the tribe of judah is going to come the one that that gives forth and and enforces law meaning god's decree this is a hint of messiah this this attitude this this behavior is very messianic verse 10. now he's talking again about victory and deliverance and restoration and we're seeing the enemies of of israel being spoken of in a defeated way he says moab shall be a a pot of my washing meaning this probably referring to a pot that was used to to wash one's feet now that's not an honorable vessel when someone comes in visiting and comes in from outside remember by and large people wore sandals their feet would be dirty and therefore to come into the home not only would you take off the sandals but you'd have to wash your feet and this is referring to that basin we might say where one's feet are washed and then it says not only against moab in a very humbling way that Moab is going to be that vessel of dishonor, also a dome. I will cast my shoe. Now, this is a place, remember, you're going to wash your feet, you take off your shoe, and you would throw it to a place where the shoes were again. Not a place of priority, of prestige in the home, a place of, of simplicity and of no honor. So he says here that a dome, I'm going to cast my my shoe or my sandal. It's to show dishonor. And unto me, Peleshit. Now, Peleshit is another term that we could say Palestinian. That's where that word comes from. It's also related to a term that related to the Philistines. And it says, unto me, the Philistines are going to shout. Now, again, It helps because when I look at the Hebrew that gives the meaning of the ancient Hebrew, it says, Aria Bekol Lehakniyam, which means the shouting with a voice that shows a submissiveness to them, meaning this. That that Peleshit is going to shout unto David acknowledging that they have been subdued acknowledging their defeat verse verse 11 in the hebrew texts who will bring me to the city of of matsor matsor is a siege and now david is saying see the change has begun This victory is being realized. This defeat of the enemy. And he's saying, who now is going to bring a siege to the city? It's not going to happen. He says, who is going to to lead unto Edom? Meaning this, is, is David going to experience Edom? Edom is an enemy now it's already been mentioned two or three times already and what david is saying is i'm not seeing that that enemy that enemy that wanted to destroy and defeat israel i'm not going to see him he he's not going to be brought unto me he's not going to come to in other words jerusalem the capital city now why isn't he now look at the next verse verse 12 in the hebrew text it says surely you O god have abandoned us and this is a question that demands a negative answer so you can understand it this way surely you O god have not abandoned us and then it's surely you're not going to go forth O god in with our our armies so god are you going to abandon us no you're not and god are you not going to go with us into battle and the implication is yes he is so the double negative implies god will indeed join israel 
in the battle, and this assures Israel's victory. Verse 13. David is saying, and he's petitioning God, and he simply says, Bring to us help from our enemy. Meaning, help us in regard to the attack, the schemes, the purposes of the enemy. And then I love this next phrase. Ve shaft shuat adam, which means vanity or vain or futile. Futile is the salvation that man offers, that comes from human beings. So do not think that 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 true victory originates, is based in man. It is not. It's based in God. God's word, his promises, his presence, and his provision. Finally, our last verse. Be Elohim na se chayel, which means in God. And remember, I've shared this many times, that this expression, in, whether it's in God or in Messiah, it refers to a covenantal relationship. And what this, this, this verse means, we're going to look at the first three verses in this first part of the verse. Be Elohim na se chayil, which means in God, in this covenantal relationship with God, we will do valiantly. And valiantly is tied to a salvation experience that manifests God's glory. I want to say that again. Valiantly foreshadows victory a victory that manifests god's purposes god's glory and it's an outcome of being in a covenantal relationship with him and then the last three words of the psalm vehu yavus sarenu which means and he will defeat our enemies god is faithful when we return to him when we say god forgive me extend to me your mercy your grace restore me back to your will i want to be used by you i want a righteous change in my life god i am sorry for my disobedience my rebelliousness but i want a change restore me back god does that god in doing that does the other part and that is Behu Yavus, and he will defeat Tsarenu, our enemies. A wonderful promise. Now, Psalm 60, a great psalm. Now that we have studied it together and we have a, a, an elementary understanding of this psalm, you know what's wise to do? Meditate upon that. What does that mean? It means to read prayerfully over and over and over this psalm implanted within you now someone might say well isn't that vain reputation no it is not it's reputation reputation but not vain reputation repeating something that is good that is powerful that is true is well that's why the psalms we should understand that they are for us each and every day. And a wise use of time is to sit down and even if you have just five or ten minutes, you may be waiting for someone, you may be in between some meeting something that you have to do. And that's why so frequently those in Israel, they carry a book of Psalms. When they're on the bus, the train, when they are waiting, whatever it might be, they understand how valuable it is to just take out a book of psalms and read one psalm a half a psalm two psalms whatever time allows you to do but but speaking the book of psalms a wonderful use of time it will bring about a change in how you think and therefore a change in how you behave well i'll close with that shalom from israel well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. 
Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.